right, stopping in for a pop culture POV. That's pop culture point of view. Say it with me, pop culture point of view. Okay, so what are we going to talk about here? I want to talk about the comparison between, well, first of all, the real world in general, the impact that it had. Um, I mention all the time, I'm an 80s baby, so I grew up in the 90s. You know, junior high, high school memories were of that era. So the real world did have an impact and an effect on a lot of people, sometimes so much that you didn't really want to watch the show because it was too real in the early era. Um, I will truthfully say that I mostly spot watched it in the early, early, early moments, but I kind of spot watched it with like a a peeking, um, you know, gazing into the show, wanting to watch more, but like saying, I shouldn't be watching that. You know what I mean? I was probably around 11 or 12, 13 years old and other 11, 12, 13 year old, uh, you know, friends would be watching mature stuff, right? You know, or, or whatever. Uh, I think the, the thing at the time was like Beavis and Butthead was a big deal, but there was something about, um, the real world that there was kind of a, you know, like, a, I don't want to say, I don't want to say shun, shun, being shunned, but there was a little bit like, oh, you don't really look at that. That's just like that wild, you know, New York lifestyle. I grew up in Southern California, but in my heart of hearts, I've always wanted to be a New Yorker, like since I was a child. Um, so to me, it was like, I need to see more. Anyways, just giving the context of the real world itself, spot watched it sort of peaked with the, uh, with the with the slight like gazing in the corner like what is that show i want to know more i love the the variety of cast members the artistic side the music side everything really matched up but i did not wholeheartedly i'm saying until later and later on you know went back um didn't really watch them as they aired you know the early ones new york the venice beach one san francisco a little um and then the other ones spot watched again um, and then really became a viewer, not even really Hawaii, like everyone loved Hawaii, but it was just wild. So, you know, like it's, it's that's great for attention, but it wasn't, it didn't really connect to me, but the new Orleans season, oh my God, what a cast, right? What a good group of people. And from that point on in that era, when the show was still sort of, uh, not scripted or wild as reality TV switched to, um, I really, and I say this all the time, and I don't know who's with me on this, but Chicago, Kara Khan, to me, one of the greatest real worlders, never did a challenge ever. She was very like unimpressed and un- unbothered, but vulnerable too. She said, did I really just say sealed the deal? Like Kara Khan is like the goat of the real world. Um, in the later, later seasons, I'm also a big fan of Mike Manning, but that might also be based on me and where I was at that stage of my life, you know, coming out at, it wasn't the same era, but it was, uh, there was just so many things that really like opened up a door for me. So I liked Mike Manning as well, who also hasn't done a challenge, (laughs) but the bigger point is I'm giving the context of the real world and how I like the show, what it, what it represented for us teenagers. And even, like I said, shameful, (laughs) and this is not across the board, but like you didn't watch the real world because of the stories were a bit raw and and very serious. And sometimes there would be, um, a hindrance between, you know, like, uh, not that I ever had, you know, some people would have, uh, parents that would, would block out shows. I never had that specifically, but there was always like a, you don't really watch that. Like that's, that's a little more wild. That's a little more, I mean, I grew up in Southern California, so it was very liberal, but like, that's a little much, but I never felt like it was much. I felt like that was a lifestyle. All of that stuff made sense, you know? So it was always very conflictual because I really probably wanted to watch my cousin of my same age. He always watched and I didn't. And I was always like feeling like I'm interested in this programming, but for some reason to admit that seemed wrong. You know, (laughs) I grew up in a baseball loving Dodger household. Like the last thing you were going to say is, yo, I'm rocking out with Norm from the real world. Like, unfortunately, that's bullshit, but it is what it is. Anyways, let me give my context to where I feel and how I think of the real world. That's that's basically my connection with it. Again, Chicago um, was a great season to me. New Orleans was a great season to me. Las Vegas was a little bit overrated, but I recently went back and watched and it actually is pretty good. Um, Bryn being probably the most interesting one. And it felt like she, she laid it on hard and then sort of 
dipped away because she probably felt like, oh gosh, when this plays back, what's this going to make me look like? Um, I'm not really sure. And, and again, there was a lot of different types of seasons. You know, Austin didn't really do it for me, but Philadelphia, I enjoyed. I auditioned for the season that was Philadelphia. I remember cause I got the little, um, call back where you had to submit a tape and <laughs> write, write all the, um, you know, the application, which was like 20 pages long. And I wrote all kinds of stuff. So that was the Philly season. Um, I remember applying, it was in Hermosa beach. Um, those that were there were there also with me, but I was of course interesting. You know, this was my, was this my pre radio career or around when I was starting radio, like kind of new at it. So yeah, there was a, there was a time where I like submitted, I wanted to be on the show, you know, but that would, that would have been the Philly season. So there's a special part of my heart for Philly The show kind of went all these different places. Um, Key West I liked. Um, And again, I I will mention the DC season seemed interesting to me. It seemed different. It really, really did. Anyways, that is not what we're focusing on. I just wanted to give the contextual like element of what I feel of the show, The Real World. Going to it now, looking back and just seeing how wonderful uh, Tammy Roman has made a career uh, through it. Obviously, she pursued music prior and she's just the fortitude that woman has is just so fantastic. I mean, I watched a lot of basketball wives, so I'm always going to rock out with Tammy Roman, <laughs> but, um, it, it's just, a, a, it kind of is the, it's like the theory you're going to be amazing. Like I'm amazing. Right. But like necessarily I haven't got casted for like this big, big project. Like I've been on TV five times, but you know, five different, you know, TLC network, fuse TV. I talk about this all the time, but nothing like substantial enough where it just changes the game. And I think there's these people like a Tammy Roman, like a Bethany Frankel, that they're always just sort of ready. And when that opportunity and their fortitude connects, like things, magic happens, I guess. Um, so I'm really focusing on this particular episode, comparing real world homecoming, (laughs) even though I haven't mentioned homecoming until this second, Real World Homecoming, New York versus Real World Homecoming, Los Angeles. I gotta say, I'm such a Tammy Roman fan, but I just feel like the Real World New York, the way the Homecoming was edited, it could have been a couple things. Let's talk about it. There was probably more of a loving moment because they were filming specifically a lot tighter to the pandemic. So who's to say, I mean... It's argued that the real world New York is just a better cast in general, not saying anyone's better than anyone else. You know, like I said, Tammy Roman is always going to be the goat, but like, how does she stand when, if she's this great, but like all of her supporting characters aren't, you know, of the level of the New York cast that, you know, that's argued. Right. Um, but again, having, having a couple elements, like, you know, being the seven years I've lived in New York city, um, collectively, It's the city has magic in general, even during the hard times. But I think, you know, there are these magical moments and it was alluded to in the uh, Los Angeles season, how they had this special moment where there was a um, something in the vein of um, supporting LGBTQIA issues. And this particular march was happening right by the New York home where that doesn't necessarily get to happen in the Los Angeles house. So even that alone is just the magic of New York, which adds to the show being really, really good. But I think the mix of cast was really strong in that first season. I actually think the mix of cast in season three is really good, too. You know, people want to say, like, was it Corey? You know, she's a cast member of yesteryear where she would never get casted these days because she was, you know, quiet and studious or whatever, vulnerable, uh, adorable, shy. But she made sense for that group. You know, Muhammad, he did his own thing. He was always doing his music, so you didn't really get to see him a lot. But when he came back, he made sense. You know, Judd, um, some would say was pretentious, but I, but he made sense. Even Rachel, you know, we, we have our issues with Rachel, <laughs> you know, and some of the stuff she puts on for the camera now in her career with, you know, Fox, Fox news and all these things. But it was a, I think the moral of the story within casting, um, is how it's well-rounded and how you make sense to each of the other cast members. Um, anyways, that's like a tangent. I'm just giving you like my whole, like what I feel about real world in general, why the show is so so special because it is so special. It's so special because when you're growing up, there's like six ways uh, in the eighties, at least, and definitely before the sixties, fifties, seventies, whatever, you know, there's all these different ways to live. And I, you know, and I know sometimes people say like, Oh, it gets cliche to say representation matters, but daggone it. Like the real world down the road even to have done stuff that 
lot of other shows never really got to do until much later. You know what I mean? I think about um, even, you know, not early enough, nearly early enough, but even Caitlin being on the Brooklyn season, you know, um, they, the real world always normalized um, young people's experience. I often say Boona Murray should do <laughs> like other aspects of the real world. I don't know if you put them all in house together roommate wise, but something in the vein of like, you know, you think of life as like, oh, you strike out to go do what you want to do in your early, early 20s. And and to a lot of people that works out. But there is this weird energy of like post 35 years old where people are now in their first divorce. You know, um, I know situations of, you know, coming out late. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you're you're barely starting to date. You know, if you're a guy, you're dating guys, you know, later in life than than, you know, your your uh your counterparts or whatever. Um, people, people start off really strong economically and then they lose a ton of money because of, you know, some wrong decisions or whatever the case. So I've always felt like the real world premise is really great for the 20 year olds for sure, which is what Boone and Murray sort of put together with MTV. But I still feel like there's a space for the starving artists, the ar- artistic, um, the person who marches to the beat of their own drum that isn't really trying to bother nobody, but they, um, have to find, find their home, so to speak, you know, it's like that magical thing about the time I moved to New York, and it was like, having nothing, but I had New York, and I always compared it to, like, my love for LA versus my love for New York City, in theory, I should love LA, but I can't stand the damn place, because it's so utterly boring, but I do have, structurally, you know, family in Los Angeles, and resources, supposedly, (laughs) Um, it just, but it doesn't speak to me, so I think the real world, why it's special, and I, I, sorry, I'm going on this tangent about, you know, um, a a real world, maybe a different version of it for, you know, a a more mature audience, not mature, but like uh, older, makes sense, because the human experience is why the original real world worked, And I'm going to get to Homecoming, which to me is why the older version works, too, because it's about the human experience and where they're at. You know, comparing New York to L.A., you got people like Irene, who Irene in L.A., you didn't really see. She's from the Venice Beach season because she was um, she was in law enforcement and she was getting married. But lo and behold, we're learning as she comes back, you know, where we have so many perceptions of her from that one season in 93 Lo and behold, if you were to do a drinking game, you would have never known that Irene is the one of all the cast members who's been married four times. So I think what's special about the real world is it's a big open look at people in their early 20s trying to find themselves in the world. But I think it has changed so much. And again, um, I'm the type of guy that worked nine days a week, every day, every week (laughs) for my first like 10 years of radio. And you would have not told me, granted, there was no social media at the time for you to do things direct to consumer like there is now. But if you would have told me I would not make it, I would have said, screw you. I work harder than anybody. But I think it is special. Maybe this is why the real world connects to me more now than ever. I'm watching the Norm story and Norm, who in the 90s is like, you know, he already was doing stuff at the Guggenheim, right? He was already uh, patenting, um, you know, different contraptions. And it seemed like his life was really going to a place. And let's not be crazy that the world sometimes is very much arced towards the youth. And to see somebody like Norm, who anyone who was watching this in the 90s and it was a teenager was like, oh my God, Norm is like sort of a beacon of of maybe who I'd like to be. You know what I mean? Not necessarily his career, but, you know, seeing somebody open. I, I think they termed him as bisexual. But the point is just doing your career, being free spirited, New York City, um, nightlife, and he was running with the cool crowd and all that stuff. And then to see that sometimes, no matter who you are, how good you are, uh, life is filled with rocky roads. And we're all we're all hit into that situation where, oh my gosh, like what had happened? How did I get here? You know, as I stated, nine days of work, <laughs> you know, there's only seven days in the, in the, in the week. But to me, I'd always put more into my work, more into my work, more into my work, more into my work. So I was, I was, I was guaranteeing success and sure. I've had a lot of bits of success, but like, it's just goes to show, um, <laughs> now I'm getting all emotional and like <laughs> slurring. Uh, but it does go to show that things go a certain way. And so my reason for bringing up that, cause I've often been, I've been critiqued, <laughs> 
Ronnie, why do you always bring up your own personal shit in a recap? And it's like, because I'm trying to tell you why this show works and why it worked back then. What, why it was a beacon of light, I suppose, by being a teenager, not knowing anything about the world and not knowing anything about life and just being a punk ass teenager. And then why it still connects when you get to see Heather B talking about her parents, uh, when you get to see Eric Neese and him talking about his career, you know, a career that at the time people would have been like, he's, he's, um, he's got everything that everyone wants, but is that short lived? And even if it's not short lived, you know, where is that level of him making tons of money, but being so dissatisfied and then him regrouping and being more in this new holistic space. And then it was also interesting that he, he wasn't even in the house cause he had caught COVID or whatever. Um, I just think the storytelling and I hope it stays that way. Um, obviously this was supposed to be a, this or that comparative, like which one do I like better? Real world homecoming, New York, real world homecoming, Los Angeles. But you know, as I'm being so openly honest and emotional about how great the programming is and what, you know, what the works of Buna Murray and John, John, uh, John Murray is doing um, and how it connected with uh, Paramount Plus, I'm, I'm kind of not trying to do a this or that anymore because though I think the New York one had a little more to offer, I think the timing definitely, as I stated a bit ago, definitely made more of a connection. I think there was parts of Kevin's story that was never really spoken about. And yet he had to go navigate, um, an industry that didn't get what he was trying to say. And now being so early to the party and knowing, and, and, and he tried and he tried and he tried and he tried in the nineties, but people necessarily didn't get where he was coming from. I think there was a redeeming factor that was kind of nice. We saw some stuff like that with the LA season. Um, because David admitted his wrongs with Tammy for sure. And Tammy, of course, uh, uh, addressed those and also mentioned other things that she was going through. But, you know, there was this one thing that stuck out to David and and probably to Tammy and probably to Beth and probably to Irene, you know, the, the false accusation using the RAPE word, like, you know, that's something that stayed with him and, and does become a snowball effect. And, you know, anyone who watches reality TV now, maybe you, you're, you're watching reality TV for the first time, you don't realize um, reality TV back in the 90s, um, like if someone had a moment and it aired on the show, that was it. Nowadays, you know, you see cast members, and I'm not even saying some of them are correct, but they go on Twitter, they recorrect the story. Sometimes they say this happened, that happened, or what you don't know is production this, production that, and then they quit the show. Like there's a lot of correcting. And while that's good, that way the cast member ultimately has a point of view. Um, uh, it, it just was, I'm just giving the painting the picture of what it was like back then if you were in a show, you were kicked out and made all these wrong doings that David had done, of course, but then the RAPE word goes attached with you. That's like, you know, it's like he could openly say, I did all these things wrong, but I definitely didn't do that. But then that's got to stick with me and that's going to hurt my comedy career. And at the time he had a comedy career. So I think that part of the LA season is very compelling. But I think the if you were to ask me, and not that I know shit about shit, but if you were to ask me why the New York one connects more than the LA one, I think it's because we knew from the way these shows are done, they're gonna go, they're gonna end up getting to the the meat and potatoes of the really dark stuff, the hard stuff to talk about. That's the show. They did it with New York. They'll probably do it with New Orleans. They'll do it with all the shows, you know. Um, but it felt like it just it, this could be the editing. It just felt like it happened so quickly. And even if, because you could say, well, that's because the LA season, they didn't really like each other as much. Because that was sort of a running theme with the LA season. I think originally when it aired in 93, um, even Glenn who came in and Beth uh, A who came in, they were like, gosh, they couldn't understand why no one really got along. Well, because they had been through a lot. But I, I'm trying to, in my, in my heart of hearts, I'm trying to assess what that feels like. If you do sign on to do the show, it felt like there was, um, I mean, I'm not speaking for the cast members, but it seems like they probably were a little bit more warm, but the way the edit went, it went right into the meat and potatoes. And I feel like it's important to have a little bit of like, I I don't want to say breaking the fourth wall. You hear a lot of that in Bravo reality TV world, but a little bit of like, oh my gosh, Tammy, how are you? I mean, whoa, you made a career out of this and, and a bunch of other stuff. 
they kind of just like, just got right into it. Um, Irene, oh, you know, you got married on the show. Are you still married? Like there was a, there was a lot of, I'm not a few, I'm not a huge fan of small talk in regular life, <laughs> but in the show, I felt like we didn't get any of that, you know? Oh, Beth. Oh, okay. You're married. Boom. Like just, oh, Beth and, um, John talk all the time. They're friendly still. Like we just didn't get much and we went right into these video messages. So that would be my only critique. And I hope we don't get that for, um, New Orleans. I hope with New Orleans, we get, you know, where's Melissa at in, in, in her life? You know, she does a podcast, uh, what's it called? Uh, Imperfect Strangers, which is very good. Um, she's a mother of three, which already on the show, she was so young and now she's probably just a spitfire as she always was. But she um, is a mother, a cool mom, you know, and she's I think she's married to uh, a musician. I think he does uh, some other work, too. But like he was she's she's with a musician. She's living in Long Island. Like, I feel like we and I like this for all the shows. We need that little bit of like the catch up. Like, what what have you been up to? You know, New Orleans is going to be interesting because Julie was scheduled to be on a very. uh, How do I say it? She was uh, had a couple decisions made being made differently. Um, she would have been in Boston on a very, very important day, um, which, which she slept in and and missed her flight. And it was a good thing. It was a good thing for her. Um, so there's going to be a lot, uh, you know, Danny being open about his HIV status. Like there's going to be a lot of really compelling things that will come up with, um, New Orleans. But I feel like we don't just jump as a viewer. I don't want to just jump into all the stuff. I want to also be like, as a viewer, like say, oh, okay, is is Kelly still with um, what's his name, the guy from Party of Five? Um, you know, Melissa, is she still, you know, saying I want Jamie to touch my butt? <laughs> you know, I think we need. I think for it to be, you got to have like peaks and valleys. And what do I know? I'm not, you know, doing a reality show. You know, if if John Murray were to ever hear my viewpoints, he'd be like, bitch, you don't know shit about shit, and I don't. But. I just think it's peaks and valleys that we need. We need the warmth for just a, uh, just a touch. Because honestly, when you watch these shows originally, um, you really got enthralled in these, these people's lives, you know, thinking about new Orleans, it's like, you know, uh, Melissa, what was her, what was her, one of her parents, shorty was, was the parent's name. You know, I'm always like, these things stay with us. So we want to know how shorty now, you know, this, that, and the other. Um, and so that to me, was maybe what was missing on the Los Angeles season. We got drama, great, oh, compelling. But I still think we could have that moment like, dang, oh my God, Tammy, you're here. Jeez, man, you had a career. You, you, since 93, you have had a career. Like, speak about that. Oh, John, what's up? Like, did your music career go anywhere? Oh, wow, God, you, it didn't. Okay, gosh, so what are you doing? Oh, I'm, um, you know, doing youth ministry. Okay, cool. Oh, Irene, God, you got married on TV. Like, how did that make you feel? Well, you know, he was the uh, parent of my of my kids. He was, you know, the father of my kids, but it didn't work. And I'm married again. Like, we didn't get any pleasantries. <laughs> oh, my God. Sometimes I feel like I just talk and talk and talk. I know I was supposed to just compare the two, but out of respect, I'm not going to compare the two. I'm just going to say that I really love this older new coming of the real world homecoming. Like I said, nothing wrong. You know, I will watch a show tomorrow (laughs) of 25 year olds, you know, going to Austin, Texas to make their dreams happen. Love that. But I just want to see more and and older, you know, people who've like been through things and have had to uh, come out of the course that they so thought would be the only way to do things, you know, uh, people go through stuff, you know, everyone at 22 feels like the, what's going to happen is going to happen, but it doesn't always go that way. So I think, I mean, I know I sound redundant because I did mention this a second ago, but what I really like about this is that I want the opportunity to re-meet these cast members and not get the same story. And I think New York did that very well. And I think LA did that very well also. But you know what? I want to see them all. Um, it's It'll be interesting to see who's up next. You know, New Orleans. I think Chicago would be a very good real world season. I think San Diego uh, would. I think Boston would be great as well. I think Seattle would probably be something that they would like to get, you know. Um, but who knows where it'll go. But yeah, Paramount Plus, real world. I, I enjoy it the same way I like real world. I'm um, sorry, the challenge, the all stars, you know, sort of. I mean, it's because of my age. I was an 80s baby. Uh, 
the Challenge All Stars, you know, kind of speaks to me a little bit more <laughs> than the regular uh, MTV version these days. But it's great programming, um, and you know, Buna Murray has has always been in the forefront of that, and um, you know, more creative ideas will happen. And I just wanted to stop down, do my pop culture POV, my point of view on what I think of these shows, you know, and I did it solo, didn't have a co-host, so I just wanted to let it rip, and so you ripped it with me, (laughs) okay, um, let's just do one last thing, wrapping this up, on both New York and LA, I'm gonna do my top dogs, like, who, who's the MVP, um, well, actually, you know, co-MVPs have to be, um, for the first one, it's gotta be Julie and, um, Kevin, because um, both felt very well-rounded. But then I love Heather B. Oh, gosh. This is just basically saying the New York uh, season trumped the, uh, you know, totally smashed the uh, L.A. season. But And then for the L.A. season, you know, the great Tammy Roman, you know, housewives, uh, well, she's not housewives, but basketball wives royalty, you know. And what's interesting about watching Tammy, though, is because I've watched so much Basketball Wives, so I, <laughs> I feel like her. I feel like I know her reality TV moves already. When she slithers in and she, you know, asks a question, and then she says something like, "Oh well, I was coming to you first because before I go to them," which then kind of puts you off guard, and you're like, "Oh, so you're gonna go tell the other person what I just said?" But then, like, she said it honestly, so you can't really knock. Like, she's just she's the goat when it comes to all that, and you know, there is a level of Real world LA uh, for the cast members who got paid handsomely that they do have to really thank Tammy for doing a lot of the heavy lifting. So as much as you want to judge Tammy, um, and I think Basketball Wives saw this too. Once Tammy left the show, and even when she got on season two in, in Miami, she adds value. Like she might be of the level of like a Bethany Frankel where they know specifically how to go in. And I wouldn't call this being fake at all. But they know, they almost have a producer's mindset without losing themselves, which is not an easy thing. I think because I've done radio for so many years, I sort of have that, but it did not happen overnight. And the reason I say that is because a lot of new reality TV people now and radio or TikTok, they have producer mindsets, but they lose themselves in it. And that is that is not what I'm talking about because I've done it before too. I have done the whole what I need to do on air to make this pop, to have a moment, boom, boom, and boom. I've had a couple of reality TV cameras on me, you know, okay, boom, boom, boom. But there is a level when you do it and you lose yourself. But uh, in regards to Tammy, Tammy knows how to come in there and get something produced, but not come so far off who she is. Like she could stay, she stays in tune where you're like, oh, that's still Tammy. And uh, Bethany Frankel was very much like that as well for the Real Housewives of New York, you know, um, And I'm like that in radio. Hello. (laughs) That's why I'm as talented as I am. Um, And I have this great career on the pop culture POV. What the fuck? No. Oh, the stress. (laughs) Why has Boone and Murray not hired me to host the uh, reunions? What the heck? I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. But yes, all in all, pretty good. I want to see more homecomings of the real world. Um, And I do think if they ever went back to the real world, maybe they could just section it off, divide it, have the young wild you know coming into the hot tub young 22 year olds but do another version do a do a, 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 a like everyone's 35 plus and and careers that were you know supposed to be big music careers failed let's see that let's see the divorced let's see <laughs> you know i love to see somebody who was gonna be something and by whatever situation and it could be me too you know, shit just doesn't always go the way you want, no matter how hard you work. That's, that's what I'm trying to tell you. Anyways, people probably say that I'm complaining, but I don't give a shit. (laughs) I'm just telling you how I feel. Um, real world homecoming, both of them were great, New York and Los Angeles. And Hey, I'd even say this, give them both the second season. Bam. That's my opinion. Um, so whoever's listening, I'm sure John Murray can't wait to hear what Ronnie thinks. So I'll come back with more episodes, <laughs> but this was just the pop culture POV. If you want to support patreon.com slash randomly Ronnie Jr. That's the end of this episode. Pop culture point of view with Ronnie. Okay. Bye. <laughs>